And uh, we have established quite a few things by this time, for those of you who have been following in a series. And uh, we understand that we can grow in holiness, as most of you have seen. That holiness uh, is a gift from God. We, we receive sanctification from Him, which is also the word holiness. And uh, that we grow forth into holiness. But I need to push it slightly more to the threshold. And that is, knowing that we grow in holiness, our next question is, is it possible on this earth to reach the fullness of holiness that God wants us to? Yes, no question again. How many of you believe that on this earth, which means in this physical body, we can reach the fullest extent of God's holiness. I know there's more in heaven, but the fullest extent of holiness so that we walk and live like an angel on this earth. Ooh. Okay. How many say yes? Thank you. And how many say no? Uh, and how many? <laughs> okay, the rest of you are not sure. John Wesley has a few ministers under his uh, uh, group of the Methodist group when he started in his revival. And one of them he was named John Fletcher. And uh, John Wesley said, or John Fletcher, he is one of the most holy men on earth that he knew. And uh, when I read that in one of uh, John Wesley's writings, I said, Hmm, I haven't heard of this man, John Fletcher. Let me find out more about him. And so, uh, that was, all this happened years ago. And I started digging for material on him. And I, it was very difficult to find. And in the end, I found some evangelical publishers that published a few sermons from John Fletcher. The John Fletcher in John Wesley's time. And when I read his sermons, I said, this man knew God. And, and to think about a man like John Wesley who really walked closely with God, recognizing someone in his generation who says, he is like an angel of God. And apparently, according to some stories circulating in those days, that sometimes when John Fletcher was preaching, and he was not, not really a pastor of some of these big churches in John Wesley's time. Remember that John Wesley, George Whitfield, and some of the others ministered to thousands out in the open fields. John Fletcher was just ministering to a, a nominal sized crowd, but he was a pastor in one of those uh, uh, groups, Methodist groups under John Wesley. But it has been said that sometimes when John Fletcher stand up to preach or minister, that some people see his face glow like an angel of God. Now there is one man in the Bible, in the book of Acts, that, that happened to, if you remember his name. His name was Stephen. And uh, just before he was stoned, the Bible tells us he was put on trial. And, and everyone in the, in the Bible says, uh, the Bible records that when they saw Stephen sitting in, the, in a place where, where all the people were accusing him, the Bible says his face was like the face of an angel. So it must have been possible. And that's just before he died. If that is possible, and it is possible to walk on this earth so close with God, and as we come to the last days, as we grow nearer to the last days, everyone is excited that Jesus coming draws near. But remember what is said about Jesus coming and the bride of Christ. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, it says that the bride of Christ is supposed to be without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. So God is not going to come for the bride, which is the church, which is going to have spots on it, uh, wrinkles or, or, or blemishes, all, in, all symbolizing of sin and imperfection. The Bible tells us the church is going to be perfected. Now, if the church is going to be perfected, obviously we have to reach a certain level of the fullness of holiness. And if we have to reach a certain level of the fullness of holiness, obviously we need to have some knowledge about how to reach that fullness of holiness. 
And if we need to have some knowledge of the fullness of holiness, then we ask around many Christians and we say, what have you been taught about holiness? And the majority of Christians have sat in churches for 20 years and never heard one sermon on holiness. They are told to be holy, but they are not told how to be holy. They demanded to be holy, but they are not told. They are told they are saved. They are told they have a ticket to heaven. They are told that they have eternal life. But they are not told what holiness is and how to be holy. And I believe one of the things that God will do in the last days, He will, he will have to first restore our understanding of holiness so that we can appropriate holiness and move into the dimensions of holiness and then become the bride without spot, wrinkle or blemish. So we do have a long way to go, but with the Holy Spirit's help, He's going to enable us. If that is true of holiness, let's pick up from where we have left off the last week on holiness, and we describe how uh, some of you, when I ask, after all this series, I ask you a question at the beginning of the series, what is holiness, and some of you give different uh, interesting answers. And now, in the middle of the series, if I were to ask you, some of you who have been here, what is holiness now? And uh, you, the answer, uh, being like God is still appropriate. Remember, it was you who was saying holiness is being like God. And uh, is holiness a state of being? Yes, it's a state of being, a state of being cleansed. What else is holiness? If we say holiness is being like God, then you say holiness is having the character of God. So holiness is a characteristic. And as you have seen in the Bible... So far, holiness is a state of being, but the state of being is produced by a nature within us. And today I'd like to speak about the nature of holiness. How that nature of holiness works. Especially now that we are born again, we have the gift of righteousness imparted upon us. We have the gift of sanctification imparted unto us. And the question is, how does that flow out and transform our life? So let's look at Romans chapter 7. At a struggle against the sin nature that Paul was trying to overcome. Remember that this section is in regard to overcoming sin. And uh, sins have been overcome and cleansed by the blood. But the nature to sin, which is sin singular, is where the battle lies. In the book of Romans chapter 7, Paul says here, in his struggle against sin, in uh, verse 7 onwards, Romans 7 verse 7 onwards, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. From, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. When the commandment came, sin revived, I died. So the sin nature took over. And the commandment which was to bring life, I find to bring death. Sin taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. It killed the good nature in him. It killed the godly nature in him. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Which is a question some of you were asking just now when I stopped reading. Say, so if the law is good, how come it's bad? This is what Paul was saying, verse 13. So next time, read your Bible. <laughs> Answer most of your questions. Verse 13. Certainly not, it says, but sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. 
Notice it says that sin might appear exceedingly sinful. That's what the commandment is. For we know what the law is spiritual, that the law is spiritual, and I am kind of so in the sin. What I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good. But it's not, it now is no longer I who do it, but the sin, that is sin nature that dwells in me. And he goes on with this struggle. Then in verse 23, he says, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Verse 20, 25, I thank God to Jesus Christ our Lord. So apparently, he got his answer. He says, I thank God to Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now, just to rephrase some of the things that we have covered. The reason why people sin is because sin looks good. None of us would have eaten, like afterwards we have lunch, and if I were to bring on a plate, uh, excuse me for being very horrifying, right? Sometimes uh, I have to illustrate. And uh, you know I have a big huge dog, right? And a big huge dog named Mozart. Suppose I were to go out to the garden, take one of the paper plates, look for one of Mozart's droppings, pick it up and place it on a plate. And then at lunch time, I come to you and say, This is special for you. <laughs> okay. okay. And none of you would eat that. None of you would. Because it smells terrible, it stings, it's awful, and you know it's bad for you. You will get sick when you eat those things. Now, if sin in all its form looked that way to us, nobody will sin. I can guarantee no human being will sin. But the devil and demons make sin look delicious. So he would take the same droppings from Mozart. Pardon me, Mozart. I'm not talking about Wolfgang Amadeus. Mozart. <laughs> but Mozart, my dog. <laughs> the devil would take that and would put all kinds of flavoring on it. Make it in the shape of chicken drumstick. Take this, uh, you can buy this Kentucky fried powder in the shops with how many spices and all that. <laughs> Dip it inside. Fry it. Put extra flavor on it and it smells nice because it's Kentucky Fried Powder on it. And I serve it to you. Without telling you, the sauce looks like a chicken, smells like a chicken. Your mind says, it must be chicken. And so you took it. It smells like chicken, looks like a chicken. <laughs> It must be chicken. So you took it and you ate it. By a second bite, you regretted it. Like all, all, all sin does that. I could imagine the face of Adam and Eve when they took their first bite. And no one would sin if sin looked like sin. Satan has to make sin look good told the woman and says, Oh, it will make you wise. And every temptation that has come to you, he has tried to make it look good. This is good, nice, delicious. And it makes you want to. That is why the law says, could we have Romans 7 out again? The only way you and I will stop sinning is for, in Romans chapter 7, what the law does in verse 13, 
the last part, he says, that the commandment, that sin, through the commandment, in verse 13, through the commandment, sin might become exceedingly sinful. That's not a word we normally use in our, in our English language, right? Very few people that you talk in converse to. That's exceedingly wonderful, right? But the Bible uses that in emphasis that it's, it magnifies the horror of sin. So that when you see sin as it is, you run. That's the only way we can be free from sin. So the commandment seems to play an important part. The commandment represents the law. The law needs to somehow create in us an understanding to be able to see sin the way God sees. Now Jesus knows this and in his prayer, in the book of John chapter 17, look over at John chapter 17. In his prayer, he mentions this, especially when he prayed for us, the church. John chapter 17, verse 17. 17, 17. It says, sanctify them. And remember the word sanctify is the same as make holy. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So, His word or His commandments are the key for us to reach full sanctification. Now, I like the way He divided it. Sanctify them by your truth. And then He says, His word is truth. Now, why separate the thing? He could easily say, sanctify them by the word. But he goes a long way and says, sanctify them by your truth. And then he says, your word is truth. He's telling us there are two processes of the word. You see, the word, this Bible can be bought at any bookshop. It can even be bought by any Christian, any non-Christian with enough money. But to the non-Christian and to the person who doesn't know God, it is a storybook. It is not truth. We believe it is the word of God. But if they don't have to they don't if they don't believe that it's the word of God, then to them it's not truth. It's a fable. A story. Historical events that may or may not be accurate to them. So we have the word, and there are many things that this word says about this life, about everything. But not everything in this word has become truth to us. Because if we are slowly getting into the truth of God's word. Let me give an example of uh, one, a man. There's this Singaporean a man. And um, he shared his testimony, so it's alright to quote his testimony. And before he was born again, he lived with two women. And uh, they are very good to him. Uh, they are both very good to him. They took care of him. And uh, they, they, they cooked for him. And uh, it was like he was living with two wives. Although they were not registered. One day he became born again. And he says, when he started reading the Bible, there's only one passage of Bible he never liked. One passage he never liked. The part that says, you shall not commit adultery. He never liked that. He always wanted to avoid that. Or he would try to find passages to justify himself. So, when he tries to justify himself, he says, oh, the Bible. Well, Solomon has only 1,000 wives. David has many wives. And, and, and Abraham has two wives. And, and Jacob has two wives. And what do you mean, therefore you, Right? After quoting all these things, I know where he's heading. Therefore, you are going to have more, right? Says the only problem is Jesus' answers is this: In the beginning, it was not so. Yes, in the beginning, it was not so. And in fact, 
you and us, then why does the Bible record that? The Bible records that to tell us that that is where their problems start. Has anyone in the Bible had more than one wife who, who, who never had problems with them? Never! Not even Abraham. Yes, not even Papa, Father Abraham. He had problems. Solomon had problems because of his many wives. David has problems because of his many wives. The Bible records that to tell us, these are the people who are done like that and these are the consequences. In the beginning, it was not so. So he knew the word, but the word was not truth to him. You know when it becomes truth? When you accept that it is for your life. When it becomes living. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so finally he struggles. And every time he gets convicted in the same area. Until finally, one day after a meeting, he went back home. And he says, look, this is the Bible. And he says, I can't do this anymore. And he says, you got to, you got to go. Emotionally, it was difficult. Because it's here, emotional and soul ties. And, but he followed the word. And in the end, they both left. And then he was alone again. And God started showing up in his life. So what has happened? The word was there, but it took time to become truth to him. And when it became truth to him, then he was sanctified in the area and God started showing up. And he became used by God mightily. He's never been to this part before, but God started using him mightily. There is a cause in all. There, I could quote some famous people that you know. Catherine Coleman. She had an affair with a married man. Right. You read a biography. Under normal circumstances, she had a good... You know, in the end, the married man left his wife, divorced his wife, and they got married. But she was never happy. Now, if you look at circumstances, the past is the past. The, the person has divorced and here's your... But she was the cause of the divorce. And God was not pleased. She could go on the rest of her life and become a mediocre, misery housewife. None of us have heard about her today. And she could live and die and go to heaven and receive a small reward. But... She keeps struggling and struggling. The Holy Spirit wants to use her, but she wouldn't let go. In the end, she talks about one day, when, one fine day, when she was walking down a street. She never mentioned which street. She was walking and walking, walking, struggling, struggling with this conviction in her heart. See, the word was trying to become truth to her. She knew that what she was doing was wrong. She knew that she was just wrong. And she walked, and so one day she walked until she reached a dead end street. And in the Bible, she says, her life was like that, a dead end. And right at the dead end, she says, Holy Spirit, I yield. From that day onwards, she consecrated her life. She chose a single life. And she gave herself to the Holy Ghost. In other words, she was like married to the Holy Ghost. She chose never more to have any relationship. She chose only to be a dedicated vessel of God. From that moment on, when she sanctified herself, the Holy Spirit started working powerfully. And through her one life, in fact, the charismatic move had, had used many people. But she was like the bulwark behind the charismatic move. That affected people far and wide. Think about, she has died and gone to be with God. Think about the reward she is now enjoying in heaven. What she could have missed, she had two choices. To choose to be a mediocre Missouri housewife, or to choose to be a vessel of God, with the call of God on her. She chose correctly. And today, she has, she has won thousands to the Lord. Affected millions of lives. And brought miracles in ways that no one has. The truth has become hers. The word has become truth to her. 
So there are many things in the word here that are speaking into our life. Until you and I act on them and accept them, they are not truth yet. They are just the word. It has the potential to sanctify us. When we accept it into our lives and obey the commandments of God, it becomes truth to us. Now, the word is so important as we see, it begins to make sin horrible. It begins to make sin exceedingly sinful. So that we know it is terrible and horrible. Uh, You notice an important key here to holiness. There must be a change on our inside. Holiness is not changing from outside in. Holiness is changing from inside out. Holiness is changing from inside out. That is why, if you try, a lot of people think holiness is thou shalt not do this, do that, do that, do that. You try with the outward things to change people, it doesn't last long. It doesn't last long. You could go and, and, and get a, um, a piglet or a pig, a different types of pig, a pig, and you could scrub the pig, dress the pig, put perfume on the pig, put the pig on a nice sofa, but if there's mud anywhere around, the pig would still run to the mud, because it loves the mud, unless the pig's nature changed. So the nature of sin will keep drawing us to sin. So something inside us has to change. When we were born again, there is a new nature placed within us. Now many people struggle with holiness. And it is like holiness is way up there. Higher than the Empire State Building. Taller than the World Trade Center. High up there, holiness is here. And we feel we are down here. Impossible to achieve. Let me point out to this fact. Holiness is inherent in our nature. I want to make that statement again. Holiness is inherent in our nature when God first made man. Not only did we have a sin nature, but we have, that's a funny thing, we have also a holiness nature from our creation. Because of that part of us that sense holiness, people who live in sin are highly convicted all the time. I mean, if you do something wrong, no one has to tell you, you struggle. For example, how do lie detectors work? Lie detectors work because when you're telling a lie, although there are people who try to train themselves against that, but generally they work, because every time you tell a lie and you say something wrong, your body reacts against you. Your whole body was created for holiness. Your whole being was created to tell the truth. So that when you tell the truth, your whole body is saying, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Every time you tell a lie, your whole body goes, uh, uh, And the lie detector catches it all. Your body reacts against it. See, I want to make, it, make you see a picture here that the devil is blinding people. They, somehow we have the idea that holiness is difficult. No, no. God has made it available for us. It is in our nature to be holy. That's why we are convicted of sin. Which part of you convicts you of sin? Your conscience. There's something within us that tells us when we do wrong. That's the part created after holiness. Now, that part can be, can be polluted, a conscience can be hardened, etc. But the fact is, every criminal today, every person out there sinning and not walking with God, right now, feels condemnation. No one has to lift up their voice and condemn them. Something is troubling them. Some of them find it hard to sleep. Some of them are in trouble. They have to drown their sorrows. They have to drown their, all the things, the terrible thoughts that are convicting them daily. Because they were not created for sin. We were created 
for holiness. And every part of our being rebels against it. So when God comes into our life to Jesus, there is a nature of holiness imparted into our lives. And it's to draw out that nature from us. To draw forth that nature, we need to know where the battle lies in regard to holiness and sin. How that nature works. And um, you notice the sentence in Romans 7 again. That sin might appear exceedingly sinful. And the whole gist of Romans 7, the whole gist of Romans 7, the whole gist of it, the battle is not without, it is within. It's not somebody on your outside. It's from within. From within. If Satan himself or all the, the worst kind of sins of the show up at your door, if inside you there is no drawing to it, it's impossible for Satan to come against you. The, your greatest enemy is not Satan. It's not even the world. The greatest enemy is yourself. It's you yourself. Because the devil has been defeated. And in this earth, to wrestle against, uh, to re- allow holiness to come forth, we need to understand there is the world, the flesh, and the devil. But if you eliminate the flesh, the world and the devil has no power over you. The devil and the world has only power if you are magnetically drawn to it. That is why Jesus, when he walked in John chapter 14, verse 30, he says, The prince of this world will come, but he has nothing in me. Look at his statement. John 14, verse 30. He has nothing in me. There's not a single fiber in his spirit, soul, and body that is attracted to the devil or the world. That's why Jesus could walk in holiness. So it has to be from inside that we fall. In the book of James, it confirms this word that we are bringing forth. In the book of James, it tells us in summary how sin works. James chapter 1, it says in verse 13 to 15, James 1, 13 to 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings death. Now, if you want to take care of your garden, you don't get at the weeds when the weeds have become too much. Yes. That one is all included under the sin too. That, yes, under sin. That, it's le- leading to eternal death. When he says, uh, uh, he just brought out a statement, there is a sin not unto death and a sin unto death. If you check the context of 1 John, it's referring to eternal death. So that is why uh, Christians are in between. See, not every sin is going to cost you your salvation. Remember that. As a Christian, it doesn't mean that the moment you sin, you lose your salvation. So you don't lose your, your eternal life. But you do lose your rewards, which is a lot in heaven. In heaven. And there is a sin unto death, which means when you cross the point, you entirely lose everything, including salvation, which is found in Hebrews 6. That's a sin unto eternal death. So all sin, however, does have the element of destruction and death. 
And the Bible tells us here that in verse 15, it starts with when you have a garden and you need to get rid of the weeds. You do not just get rid of your weeds by cutting the top of the weeds. You get the weeds by getting rid of the roots. And you try to prevent seeds from falling, the weed seeds from falling in the garden. Right? We're not that much good at gardening, but my neighbor is a, is a man in Luke, and he's a, uh, he's a former army man, and we used to chat once in a while. He keeps a very nice garden. And sometimes I'm out, he, out at the garden talking with him, and he tells me, I say, your grass looks nice. And he tells me how he has to maintain his grass. He says he has to keep all these uh, weed seeds from coming, so he builds this wall. So that when the wind blows, it doesn't get into his grass. And, and all these things that he does. And, and so you have to pull it up by the roots. You have to prevent wrong seeds from falling into that place. And it takes time to maintain a good garden. Good gardens don't come by accident. No. If you neglect it for a year, it doesn't look like a garden anymore. It looks like a jungle, mini jungle. Weeds grow all over the place. The source of all sin is given to us in verse 15. Desire. See, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then when sin reaches fullness, it produces death. Sometimes it produces physical death without spiritual death. Sometimes it produces both physical and spiritual death. That's in line with what statement has been made. Consequences. Now, if we know it, the way to treat it is deal it a blow right where the desire is. Correct. Right where the desire is. And that is from within. Something from within us would have to be dealt with, would have to be changed. Don't worry about the devil. You have more authority over the devil than you realize. Let me give you a few snippets of scripture that, that just show for your authority. In the same book of James, chapter 4, it tells us here in verse 7, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He's not talking to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, or great leaders. He's talking to every single Christian. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, the word flee in the Greek is a very powerful word. It didn't just say, resist the devil. And he will slowly draw away from you. He didn't say, resist the devil and uh, uh, he will just pass you by. No. When you resist the devil, it says, he will flee. And in some translation, it says, he will flee in terror from you. Now, you know the devil likes to terrify people. <laughs> and all the monsters they draw in all these movies, they're trying to make the devil and gals and all the demons look horrifying. They're trying to scare people, scare the wits out of people. What fun we have to terrify the devil. See, the only way he flees, he's not just walking away from you. He is fleeing. In other words, you just made the devil scared. So you go, boo, and the devil, ah! There are enough scriptures to tell us we have authority over the devil. You don't have to be afraid of the devil, but the devil is worried because he's wondering whether you're one of those who know that verse. Because you can make, let me emphasize again, you can make the devil afraid of you through Jesus Christ. So every morning when you get up, the devil says, oh dear, he's awake again. We have more authority. Now, why doesn't the authority work then in the body of Christ? Because you must have John 14 verse 30. The devil must have nothing in you. Now, He's just looking for a place. In the book of Ephesians 4, Paul says, Do not give place to the devil. Don't give him any room inside. The world will also lose its attraction if there is nothing in you that responds. You see, our disadvantage is 
when you are when you are losing the battle from inside, you will lose it from outside. But if you have, that's what the Bible says, it's far better for a man to conquer his temper than to conquer a city. Because when you have conquered your own temper, you have conquered a city. So the battles are raging inside. If we could conquer from the inside, you will be fearless before the world and the devil. There's the flesh, the world, and the devil. Now, when you deal with the flesh, the world, and the devil, immediately it becomes a simple matter to deal with. It's the flesh. Your greatest enemy is you. Your own self. Our unrenewed self. Our, our things within us that yield to the enemy. Now, the yielding process is where the wrong desires come. There's a part of us there is a sin nature that lies in our physical body in its imperfect state. And then there's a part that lies in our, our spirit man that is a new nature. And the two are doing battle every day. And the only way you and I can win is for us to be filled with the Word. Because the Word will sanctify you and I. The, you are sanctified, we are sanctified through the truth. His word is truth. In other words, His word that is in the process of becoming truth sanctifies us. The less word you have, the less sanctified you are. The more word you have, the more sanctified you are. I have made your Christian life a very, very simple. It's a matter of spending time in the word. If you don't believe me, do this. Take three months off and don't read anything except the Word of God out loud. Don't do anything else. All your free time, just worship God, pray and read the Word out loud to yourself. And see whether at the end of three months it's easy to sin or not. You'll find it difficult. Because the Word fills you so much and in other types of desire come forth. Desires for God, desires for hunger for God. The, the new spiritual desires overwhelm the old desires. And the more you get into the Word, sin becomes exceedingly sinful. Sin smells like sin the way it should. And the devil, you can recognize him. It's from our inside that we overcome. From our inside. And that's what God is bringing us to. The Word is truth. So let the Word rise within us day by day. It is a daily process. So the Bible says, meditate upon the Word. Christian life is not as complicated as people make it. Yes. Yes, amen. It's not like we've got to get some, some enormous truth or revelation of God. It's not. You have in your hands the Word. This Word just needs to become truth to you and I. When you read the, the Bible, you don't understand everything. But the more you read it, the more you saturate yourself with it, more of it can be translated into truth in your life. And it removes all those wrong desires out of you. And the more you spend time with the Word, and I'm talking from experience, I spent one year after I graduated from the Baptist Seminary, I was struggling to grow in the Spirit, struggling in the ministry. And God gave me a vision of my spirit man and I found that I didn't have much power against the enemy. I saw demons out there. I just didn't seem to be able to get through. And when I saw that, I said, God, you've got to teach me how to feed my spirit man. And God showed me the truth of meditation on the Word. And for one entire year, I spent six to eight hours on the Word. Some of you have seen the green meditation food, God's meditation food. That's a tiny 1% extract of 
all the meditations that I did. Spent one entire year on the Word. I didn't see TV, didn't hear radio, didn't read any books except the Word. Just for one year because I wanted, I was desperate for God by that time. Something happened during that one year. I cannot exactly pick a day. But somewhere in between the six to nine month period, after spending six to eight hours on the Word, something clicked inside the mind. I suddenly began to see things I couldn't see before, spiritually. It was like Luke chapter 24 taking place. What is Luke 24? Well, let me read that verse to you. In Luke chapter 24, it says there, in um, verse 31, Their eyes were open and they knew Him. And then there's another thing that happened in um, Luke 24, to the disciples, um, in verse 45, He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So something happened to them on that day. They had all the scriptures. These are Hebrew people. They were brought up, although they could be fishermen and common folk, they were brought up with the Torah, the law, and they were they, they, they know and they hear the scriptures in their synagogue every every time. But they never understood it. Something happened on that day and God made them to see things in the scriptures that they cannot see before. So between the six to the nine month period, something happened. It was like it was like suddenly uh, uh, your mind was operating by 10 volts and suddenly it, it operated by 100 volts. Like the light came inside. And I saw things in the scripture I never saw before. And I began to have spiritual desires strong that I never had before. So strong, spiritual desires need to be strong. Sometimes people ask, how can you spend 6 to 8 hours a day? The difference is desire. See, the problem between a disciplined person and an indisciplined person is desire. It's not muscular problem. It's not uh, enough sleep or not enough sleep. We all have 24 hours. It, it's, not those, it's not a mental area either because everyone has sufficient you know, intelligence enough to at least read the word. It's not all those things. The problem is desire. Uh, something began to happen. I began to desire spiritual things that I never desired before. The spiritual thing became more attractive to me than the natural thing. And it was not instant. I, it was gradual. It's just like your children growing. In a year they grow, but you cannot see every day that they have grown. You just know that they are growing. Within a year, that started taking place. And from that day onwards... All the rest of my ministry and life is founded on that one year that I dedicated with God. That one year changed my entire life ministry. It changed everything. It was the Word. That is why today I still love to meditate on the Word. Still love to meditate. And I try to get at least four or five hours with God every day. Morning we are praying here two hours. And go back and I got another two hours in the Word and get another extra hour in between. And I believe every minister to succeed needs to spend at least four or five hours with God every day. If any pastor who is hearing this way, are you raising your hand? Yeah? Yes. Put the desire first. That's right. He can put a desire there first. And sometimes how you put a desire is when you pray, there's an impartation of a desire. When you associate with the right fellowship, it puts a desire in your life. When you read spiritual books, it puts a desire in your life. For example, if you read a book about Catherine Kuhlman, it causes you to desire to see miracles. If you, so it, your association, your fellowship, and all those things produces desires in your life. And, and so sometimes one desire can lead to another desire. 
As you all know, some of you, after church, after lunch, you go off to the supermarket to get something. You went to get A. Then you saw B. Then you got C. Then you got D. You got a lot of whole other things that you saw. One desire can lead to a lot of other desires. But as you yield to that one desire, it will start you on the road to go. You could have a survey. Let's say we take a survey of all the Christians in town. Gather them in one place and you ask the Christians there. How many of you have felt in your life that God wants you to spend more time with Him? I can guarantee you 99% of them put their hands. But then you ask a second question. How many of you have actually done that? See the difference. The difference is one group had the desire and they know it but they don't spend time. They don't yield to the desire. And another group yield to it and they get the rewards of more things coming. More things coming. The Bible says, I has not seen, nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. A lot of other things. I believe that every minister who calls themselves full time, right? I'm not even full time in God, but I know what it's like to be full time. You have time to spend with God. And that's what the purpose is, that you're full time. So that you could be away from secular work and dedicated to giving yourself to God. Amen. And I have a louder amen. And, and it is a shame if someone calls them full time, calls themselves full time, and they don't spend their time with God. But they spend their time running around doing natural things. Although there are a lot of natural things to be done. And I would say, that's why there is no revival. But if every minister would spend their time with God and seek God on their, on their face and on their knees and every day, think about it. If all the probably 300 over pastors in Canberra were to spend five hours with God every day, I think every church would be transformed. I believe so. So uh, the problem is not God, the problem is not the Word, the problem is not the Holy Spirit, the problem is us. We are not yielding to those desires. And the only way we can see revival, the only way we can get into the depths of God, is to yield to that desire in our life. The desire for God. So there are two desires fighting inside us. The good ones and the unredeemed one. And the more you grow the right desires and yield to the Spirit, when you look back three years later, you say, Hey, I didn't even know that those things were that, that you know, were powerful in my life. All your, all your temptations, your blemishes, your spots, your weaknesses, will wrinkles too, will disappear, spiritually speaking, alright? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll get someone come to me and say, Pastor, I did all those things, look at extra wrinkles. So what do you say? Uh, will disappear, maybe not overnight, but over the gradual process, as you spend time, in the Word of God. The key is right in front of you. The Bible. The Bible. Get into the Bible. Read the Word. Meditate on the Word. And don't check every day. Not, no parent every day measure the child. Let me see how much you have grown. Right. But you check over one year, you can find the growth. So you may not even notice yourself changing. But I will guarantee you by the Word of God that you spend that quality time in the Word and in prayer, especially meditating on the Word. Remember, the Word is the important part. Prayer is good. I know a lot of people spend time prayer, but you need to get into the Word. Because if you pray alone and you don't have enough Word, the quality of your prayer can diminish. And you know how important quality is. You can do in one hour... What somebody takes three hours because you know the right way to do it. That's quality. So, your one hour of quality prayer can be very effective when you know the Word. You know how to battle with the Word. So, get the Word of God in. Besides spending time in prayer and the Word, uh, in, in worship, get meditate on the Word every day. And every Christian should know this Word like the back of their hand. Although some people don't even know the back of their hands. They should know this word. This word that you are holding in your hand 
was paid with blood. Humans, Christians have died to get this Bible translated for you and I. There are people in other countries who don't even have the written word. And if they had just one page of the written word, they would have been, been, uh, been willing to sell their house for it. But we have Bibles and we even have extra Bibles on our shelves. But the Bible is not good in your shelf. It is only good when it's in your heart. And if you and I will take time to let that word come into our life every day. As I said, what's the key to growth? Holiness is growth. Eat properly, exercise properly, be in the right environment and you'll be alright. Spiritual growth is the same. This is your food. Prayer is your lungs breathing. Worship is the atmosphere around. You get the right food. You get breathing. I know, I know some people don't, they say, well, that, do you mean that if I don't, I don't pray, I don't breathe? Yes! <laughs> then shouldn't I have died? Yes, you almost and you die <laughs> spiritually. Prayer is like breathing. The Bible tells us this whole world is in darkness and we are the light of the earth. Can you imagine going down into the depths of the ocean and not being able to breathe? You need to take your oxygen with you. And you need to be replenished. Prayer is like that. In order for the world not to get into us and not to be drowned by the things of this world. A lot of Christians are not praying, therefore they are drowned. You can tell they are drowned because they are spiritually half dead. They talk like the world, they think like the world, they desire like the world. You know what they are? Half drowned. Spiritually, half dead. And God cannot use half dead Christians. We need to breathe fresh air again. Amen. And then when you worship, it's not just you, it creates an environment around you. And you have proper food, proper exercise in prayer and worship. It's a guarantee that you will be changed, transformed into God. I pray that more Christians will take up this challenge. I will challenge you in the name of the Lord to meditate on the word one hour a day if possible as a start. And tell me at the end of six months that nothing has changed in your life. I have given this challenge from years ago. And in 25 years of ministry, I have not got someone come back and say, Pastor, I'll spend, I've been reading the Word consistently for one whole year and nothing has happened. No one has come back. Because it works. It's simple. It works. Let's pray.